this weekend I was making some coffee and I usually add some low calorie sweetener to my coffee. I make my coffee one cup at a time using a filter because it's more like chemistry to me, I guess. And I bought this sweetener at, at the grocery store and usually I just buy this stevia sweetener. And this time the, the bottle I grabbed said stevia and monk fruit. I'd never had that before, which seemed kind of interesting to me. And I'm, I think I know something about the steviazide compounds that are contained in the sweet leaf plant. That they put in there but I didn't know anything about monk fruit so I was fascinated by that and I wanted to learn more about what are these sweet tasting compounds that they put in monk fruit uh, that would cause this to be a zero calorie sweetener uh, that might be healthier for me than um, than sucrose or some type of sugar compound so let me just remind you of why compounds taste sweet to you you've got the human uh, proteome has two main receptor proteins that sit on the, on the surface of your tongue cells. So I, I've drawn a picture of those two um, proteins. It's the T1R2 taste receptor and the T1R3 taste receptors, the main receptors that you have in your tongue cells that detect sweetness. Structurally, they look very similar. If I put one up or the other up without comparing them side by side, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these. It's not really important. But there's a binding site here, kind of like the, the venous flytrap portion of the molecule where sweet tasting molecules bind. N not all sweet tasting molecules, but some of the common ones like sucrose, um, aspartame. And there's some plants that contain a, a class of compounds called glycosides. Glycosides are molecules where some non-sugar type molecule uh, is attached to sugar type molecules. And in chapter 27 of the textbook, we're not going to get to that chapter, but there's an entire chapter devoted to sugar-like molecules, uh, which are particularly important for glycobiology. And these molecules bind to the same active flytrap portion of these receptors as sucrose and glucose bind to. So that, that sweetener that I was using in my coffee contains extracts from stevia leaves, sometimes called sweet leaf, and monk fruit. And here's the two main compounds that are responsible for the sweetness. Uh, in stevia leaf, it's a compound called steviazide. And the central portion of this is just an organic compound, this greasy looking organic compound just composed of a bunch of C's and H's. Biosynthetically, I would refer to that as a terpene. Um, usually they have multiples of five carbons in terpenes. And I can see readily attached to this terpene are three glucose molecules. Here's a glucose molecule on the bottom. Here's a glucose molecule over here. And I, this should be a glucose molecule. And I've simply forgotten to write the hydroxyl group on the bottom. I apologize for that. So this molecule is holding three glucose molecules out in front of it so that when it binds to the, the active side of these taste receptors, it, the positioning the molecules in that way helps them to bind more tightly. Um, and inside of monk fruit, there is another glycoside with a central terpene core that looks very much like cholesterol to me or um, just because it has a common tetracyclic ABCD framework of a steroid. And it has five glucose molecules attached to it. This magrazide 5 compound, uh, just like the steviazide, is hundreds of times sweeter than sucrose. So if you had to take 10 milligrams of, uh, of, um, of these compounds to make your, your drink taste sweet, you'd have to take a whole gram of, of sucrose to make your coffee taste equally sweet. So it's, uh, th these compounds are, are glycosides. They've, again, they have sugar components, glucose attached to other non-sugar components. Um, and if you go to chapter 27 in, in the fifth edition of the, our textbook, you'll find an entire chapter on on molecules where sugars are connected to things. And again, I apologize for not having this hydroxyl at the bottom of this steviazide glucose moiety that's bothering me. Um, let's go ahead and get on to the subject of chapter 20. Uh, get back to addition to carbonyls, which is so unbelievably important. You'll have to give me a moment here while I switch over my screens and get onto the uh, document camera so I can draw some chemical structures. <laughs> We, we've been talking about the addition of hydridonucleophiles to make HC bonds by adding uh, nucleophilic carbon hydrogen bonds um, or 
nucleophilic hydrido groups to make carbon hydrogen bonds by addition to carbon eels. And we left off talking about uh, how to use hydrido nucleophiles like lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride to reduce ketones and aldehydes. And then we started talking about addition, reduction of esters using lithium aluminum hydride and diisobutyl aluminum hydride, which stops at the aldehyde stage. So let me give you two more functional groups that you can reduce with lithium aluminum hydride, which is by far the more powerful of the two reducing agents. Uh, this is a reaction you couldn't do with sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride only reacts with ketones and aldehydes. And, um, and so let's go ahead and uh, talk about this powerful reagent, lithium aluminum hydride, and its ability to reduce carboxylic acids all the way down to alcohols. So if you use that same two-step procedure, and you have to enumerate this procedure with, um, and I'm not even sure if I am, you know, this is, this is taking a picture of me with the, I have to try to fix this so it looks like uh, I'm using the wrong camera here. I've got more than one camera. Here we go. This will fix it, I think. <laughs> there we go. That's a little bit better of an image. Just give me a break here. So much technology. It's crazy. Okay, we're back in business, and now I can, I can look at you and get really excited about, about the chemistry as I talk and wave my hands, and you can see what's going on. So we're talking about the ability of lithium aluminum hydride to reduce carboxylic acids, and we have to use this two-step recipe. Step one, lithium aluminum hydride, and step two, H2O workup. I don't always write the word workup there, but when I write H2O, I just want you to know that I'm not using that to do SN2 reactions or SN1. I'm just trying to protonate any O minuses. We like to isolate neutral molecules as organic chemists. And so this reduces carboxylic acids all the way down to CH2OH groups. Let me go ahead and draw up the structure of that product. Here's the product. And what you can't tell is that I formed two carbon hydrogen bonds. There's another product in there that I'm just completely uninterested in. And so let me draw in, in the new bonds we formed. Look at those bonds, it's fantastic. And there's a completely boring product that's in here. There we go, it's, it's water. So we already saw this type of reaction with esters. So it, if you do these types of reactions with esters, it's very much the same kind of a process. So it, if you had this with a methanol group there, and we did the same two-step procedure. I'm, I'll just write it out. It's so get used to writing this out. Lithium aluminum hydride, step one. Step two, H2O workup. And I told you, if you forget the enumeration, it's totally wrong. And I would give you zero points for that. You simply have to remember to write out this enumerator. You can't just throw in um, pyrophoric reagents like lithium aluminum hydride in the presence of water. The water is a second step. And so, we already saw this pattern of reactivity where if we take esters, we can reduce them down. Um, and in this case, the other byproduct has a carbon atom, so I would want you to draw both of those. Uh, but this is a common procedure to take carboxylic acids and reduce them down to primary alcohols. And you can see, uh, if I ask you to draw the products, I don't expect you to draw the water molecule. The water molecule doesn't have any carbon in it. It just gets lost in the workup with the, the H2O that you added to the, to the reaction mixture. Okay, so that's so similar to reduction of esters that it's not really that interesting. Here's the interesting transformation that you're going to see a lot when we get to the amines chapter, chapter 25 in the, in the fifth edition of the Smith textbook. And so let me go ahead and draw it. I, I could have one alkyl group or two alkyl groups on, on an amide. So this is an N-alkyl amide, kind of like the, all the, the, the amide bonds in, in the backbone of any protein in your body is made up of these kinds of amide bonds. But you could also have NN dialkyl amides where there's two different, instead of an H, there's another alkyl group on there. And when we treat these with lithium aluminum hydride, you get a very different pattern of transformation. It's the same two-step sequence, lithium aluminum tetrahydridoaluminate or lithium aluminum hydride. You can you say that either way, we follow this up with an aqueous workup or we just swamp it with a ton of extra water. Um, and the product of this reaction does not involve carbon nitrogen bond cleavage. So once you get used to reducing esters and carboxylic acids and cleaving the bond to that group, 
you're going to get here and you're going to have a tendency, which is completely logical to break the carbon nitrogen bond, but it doesn't break. The carbon nitrogen bond does not break. The product of the reaction still has that carbon nitrogen bond there. That's the product of the reaction, right? And you can tell what happened here. I hope you can tell. We just formed two new carbon hydrogen bonds. Let's draw them in. I'm going to draw those in in red. Normally I wouldn't draw them in and you, it would be up to you to recognize that we just formed two carbon hydrogen bonds. And the other byproducts, water, we don't even care about that. I'm not going to bother drawing it. So look at the difference here. Here we cleave the bond. We cleave the bond between the carbon and the OH. Over here with the ester, we cleave the bond between the carbon and the O methyl. And then down here, we do not cleave. With the amide, we don't cleave the carbon nitrogen bond. And you're going to forget that distinction. It, it will be natural to you to want to cleave the carbon nitrogen bond, and you simply have to practice this enough in the sapling problem sets by working problems in the book to know, uh, to, to be used to using this powerful tool of lithium aluminum hydride um, and not make a mistake on those transformations. Not, nothing other than practice is going to help you to be good at using those reactions. I'm sure I'll, I'll be asking that. And I guarantee you when we get to the later chapter on amines, chapter 25 in, in our textbook, this the Smith fifth edition, I guarantee you, you're gonna be using that reaction again. I'm going to show it to you and I'm going to say, remember back in chapter 20 and you'll vaguely remember it. I hope you'll really remember it, but let's try to be honest about, <laughs> about how things disappear because I'm just gonna keep showering you with new chemistry and it's just hard to keep everything in, in mind if you don't practice it over and over. Let's go ahead and talk about the mechanism for that reaction of the amide down to an amine where the carbonyl group seems to disappear. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, contrast this. Contrast. If, if I ask you to do this type of a transformation, this may look a little bit similar to a Clemenson reduction with zinc mercury amalgam and HCl or hydrazine. So contrast uh, with uh, reduction of ketones. We showed you this set of reaction uh, of ketones and aldehydes. And we told you, oh no, you can't do the, these, uh, and it was in chapter, uh, sorry, in chapter 18 where we showed you how to do acylation of benzene rings and then reduce down carbonyl groups using zinc mercury amalgam or hydrazine. Um, and I said, don't try to do that with amides or esters. I told you we'd get to a different pattern of reactivity. And so now we're at that pattern of reactivity. Let's go and talk about the mechanism for this reaction. And I'm going to, instead of drawing some fancy complex substrate, I'm going to pick the simplest amide I can think of structurally. And it would just be a simple N-alkyl acetamide. So an acetyl group on here. And the R group doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll, I'll just put an N uh, NR down there. Now, tetrahydrotoaluminate is a very basic compound. If you expose tetrahydrotoaluminate to water, it will immediately deprotonate the water. If you expose it to a carboxylic acid, it would immediately deprotonate the carboxylic acid before doing other stuff and adding hydrido groups to the carbonyl group of the carboxylate. When you expose tetrahydrotoaluminate to an amide, this has a pKa very close to that of water. It's about as acidic as water. And so these basic and nucleophilic hydrido-aluminate bonds will, will deprotonate that H. I'm going to draw um, the electrons. I can't have two bonds to this, to this H atom. So if I attack the H atom, I have to give those electrons somewhere else. Instead of leaving them on the nitrogen, I'm going to draw the arrow pushing like this that gives a resonance structure directly. It would be okay if you left the negative charge on nitrogen. It would lead to the same compound, just a resonance structure. But when I leave the negative charge on this oxygen atom, it just reminds me why it was so easy to pull that proton off the nitrogen because we get to leave an, uh, um, a negative charge on oxygen. And so sometimes I'll go ahead and circle that negative charge. So we end up with this deprotonated amide and, and, and allane, ALH3, is this incredibly electrophilic oxygen-loving species. It's like a Lewis acid. 
And so let me go ahead and draw out what's going to happen. There's also a lithium cation that's floating around here. I'm not going to draw that lithium plus. It gets involved in ways that I ought to depict, but I'm going to choose not to because it would simply make the mechanism more complex. Uh, but let me just go ahead and acknowledge the fact that oxygen loves aluminum, just loves that aluminum is a powerful Lewis acid. And so that aluminum is gonna grab that oxygen and then never again let it go. Let's go ahead and draw out that, that species, this oxygen coordinated aluminum species. <clears throat> now, if, I, if aluminum was neutral here and I attack it, well, it better pick up a negative charge. And when I, put a, when I use two electrons from oxygen, the, the negative charge will disappear from the oxygen. Okay, so we end up with this species here that has, that's now got this neutral carbon nitrogen bond and the oxygen is neutral. And there's going to be more uh, tetrahydrital aluminate in there. And there it is. And so this is going to attack this CN double bond. It, um, I want you to notice that I broke, this mechanism is so long that I broke it up onto two different slides. It's just a long ass mechanism. <laughs> so it's on two different slides. So I'm only gonna get part way done with this mechanism on, at the end of this slide. So unfortunately, it's just long. It's a long mechanism to describe here. So I'm going to attack that carbon nitrogen double bond. I'm gonna make an HC bond here when I deliver that hydrido group to the, the, that C double bond end. And this is a pattern you're going to see a lot more of in the next chapter when we talk specifically about classes of compounds that have uh, double bonds between carbon and nitrogen. And so we'll generate a tetrahedral intermediate when we do this. Th there was a lone pair here, I'll draw it. So now there's two lone pairs. Wow, that is so incredibly reactive. You've seen species kind of like this before where you had N with two bonds and a minus. Sodium amide is a, is a base that you use to deprotonate alkynes way back in chapter 11 of, of the textbook. Um, and so that is just such a powerful, powerful set of, of lone pairs. We're gonna use lone pairs like this, so powerful um, later on in the, in the course. And so now this pushes out this leaving group. And this is going to look really uncomfortable to you with two negative charges and the, Part of the resolution to that is there's a lithium cation floating around and I didn't really tell you what's going on. And I noticed that I just got a, a sign on my computer that said internet connection is unstable. I hope we're not going down that road again. We'll see what happens with that. And so now I get this species called an imine. And there's the imine. There's an H here, I'll, I'll draw that, that imine. So let me just say, this gives an imine. We're getting ready to have a whole chapter on imines coming up but let's keep going. We're not done with the mechanism. We're just part way done with this reduction of amides all the way down to amines via an imine intermediate. And so let's go ahead and watch what happens to that imine. So we've got this imine in there. Here's the imine. <clears throat> and there's a lone pair on, on the nitrogen. And we've got more tetrahydrotoaluminate in there. I'll draw it with this orientation. I keep changing the orientation of this tetrahydrotoaluminate. But that, those bonds between the hydrido group and the aluminum are so, um, it looks like I'm underlining the aluminum. So let me circle the charge so it's clear that that's a, that's a negative charge. And then we'll push the electrons over to the nitrogen. It's not easy to add to those carbon nitrogen double bonds when they don't have a positive charge on there. It's, that's actually quite difficult. And so then we'll end up with this intermediate. Again, it's got a negative charge on nitrogen and, and two single bonds. Uh, that is just aggressively, aggressively basic. But it will sit in there until we work up the reaction. So finally, we come in with our H2O workup. You can go off to lunch and it'll be sitting there. You can come back from lunch. It'll be sitting there. You can go home overnight and come back the next morning and it'll be sitting there. But when you dump water into this reaction, it protonates that species. And so then the product of the reaction uh, after it picks up a proton is the amine, is the neutral amine. You have to get used to using this reaction. It's, um, 
Let me give you another example. You just have to practice using this reaction. So if I, if I give you something like this and I say, how are you going to reduce that carbon yield down to an amine? I promise you I'll expect you to know that. Certainly by the time we get to the amines chapter, this is gonna be your go-to reaction here. Um, don't try to do some Clemenson reduction or wolf kieschner reduction from, from, the, from a previous chapter. You use this lithium aluminum hydride, step one. If you wanted, you could use Arabic numerals here. Uh, that's fine too. And then you follow it up with an aqueous workup. That's the way to do that reaction. And I expect you to know how to do that reaction. Okay, um, the book in, in section 20.8 in the fifth edition of our textbook talks about oxidation of aldehydes to carboxylic acids um, using this chromium oxidant in water. It, it's kind of coming back to stuff that you learned back in chapter 12 of the book, which is reduction and oxidation chapter. There was a bunch of chromium reagents in chapter 12. You should go through and read this. It's a review. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure why you would want to do this particular transformation, but um, maybe I'll think of a reason. I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like it's important enough for me to review that again, since you've already seen that in the previous chapter. Okay. Oh, that is so... Reduction of amides uh, with hydrido groups. Okay, that's, we're done with hydrido reagents. Lithium aluminum hydride, don't forget diisobutyl aluminum hydride, dibal H. Don't forget that, it reduces esters to aldehydes. That's important, esters to aldehydes. It's an important transformation. Now, let's go ahead and talk about organolithium compounds, organomagnesium compounds, um, sodium acetylides, again, that you've seen before in a previous chapter. Let's go ahead and get to these, these types of compounds. Let me go ahead and draw for some, some reagents. Something special happens when you take carbon containing compounds and you bond them to these electropositive metals. If you make carbon lithium bonds, carbon sodium bonds, carbon magnesium bonds, those bonds are super nucleophilic and super basic. Let me go ahead and make a list of some of these species that you're going to see. Whoa, su, I'm not good at spelling super. Super basic and super nucleophilic. Both, they're both super basic and super nucleophilic. So keep water out of these reactions. Don't let water get into these reactions or you're just going to get a, an acid base reaction, which that's not that interesting. <laughs> What's interesting is carbon carbon bond formation. Okay, so what are some species we're going to see? We're going to see bonds between alkyl groups and lithium. Things like methylithium, phenylithium, vinyl lithium, um, every kind of uh, isopropyl lithium, tert-butyl lithium, that pyrophoric reagent that bursts into flames. These are super reactive compounds. So we're gonna see how just how useful these are for carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. So when you bond carbon to lithium, you end up with a super basic and super nucleophilic bond. Let me bring you back to a reagent that you've seen before. Sodium acetylides. There's a bond there that's super basic and super nucleophilic. You never expose these to water. You just end up protonating the alkyne after you went through all the trouble of deprotonating it. So we're going to see these powerful, powerful reagents. Um, Alkyl lithium reagents, and you'd already, you already knew this, this uh, sodium acetylide reagent. Then, in addition to these alkyl lithiums and sodium acetylide reagents, we're going to talk about some magnesium reagents called Grignard reagents. And they have general structures that look like this, alkyl magnesium chloride. It could be ethyl, it could be methyl, it could be phenyl, it could be propyl or butyl, doesn't matter. If you have a carbon chlorine bond, you can convert it into a carbon magnesium bond. Um, there's maybe one exception to that. I'm not sure if we'll get to that, but I would certainly tell you if we got to that exception. We're also going to see reagents that have bromomagnesium groups. They do the same stuff as chloromagnesium. And we'll also talk about re reagents that have iodomagnesium groups on there. The key point here is there's a carbon magnesium bond and those bonds are nucleophilic. And we refer to these reagents as Grignard reagents. 
So if you hear me say the word Grignard reagent, I'm thinking about nucleophiles uh, that have carbon-magnesium bonds. And again, they're also basic, but I would never choose to use this as a base to deprotonate water or that's a side reaction I'm trying to avoid. We keep water out of these reactions. Let's talk about these reagents. Uh, super, so powerful for making carbon-carbon bonds. And we need to talk about how, how to think about those bonds. Why should they be so basic, so nucleophilic, and so reactive? What is it that makes these carbon-lithium and carbon-magnesium bonds so reactive? It will help us to draw out resonance structures to understand that, that reactivity. So let me go ahead and draw some resonance structures here. Um, and we'll, we'll try to understand that. So <clears throat> let me go ahead and start. We'll just take the simplest Grignard reagent we can. That's with a methyl group and a chloromagnesium group. There's a carbon-magnesium bond there, and it is super, super reactive and super nucleophilic. The way to think about the reactivity is to draw out a resonance structure. I'm going to draw a resonance structure, and I'm going to give these electrons in this bond to the more electronegative atom. Carbon is further over to the right of the periodic table. Carbon is the more electronegative atom in this pair, carbon versus magnesium. So I'm going to give the electrons to the carbon. Man, you haven't seen anything like that before, I don't think, except for the sodium, the alkynyl sodium species. So you know, the second best resonance structure that we can draw for this is going to have negative on carbon and a positive on magnesium. If you want to understand what the chemical reactivity of this species is in the presence of water, well, I, you know, if you put this in the presence of water, it's just going to deprotonate the water, right? If you use this resonance structure, I, I don't use this resonance structure. I draw these species like this with a single bond. Let me go ahead and draw out this, and we'll see that we can do exactly the same deprotonation if, if we use uh, this resonance structure. This is how I would encourage you to draw a Grignard region. I, I don't encourage you to draw it in this charge-separated uh, resonance structure here that has no bond. So if, we, if this thing came into contact with a water molecule, it doesn't matter which resonance structure we chose to draw, we'd still end up with uh, deprotonation of the water. And then the product in these cases would be the same product. It would be um, completely uninteresting methane. Boy, we don't need to synthesize methane in this class. That's not what we're, what we're interested in is using this carbon-magnesium bond to add to carbon heals. That's, what's in, that's what we're interested in. And all this resonance stuff, it's the same idea, same resonance depiction and reactivity for alkalithium bonds. Resonance and depictions um, and reactivity. If you have some bond to lithium, you, you draw the resonance structure with R minus and lithium plus, and it, it reacts like it's R minus. Boy, these things are so reactive. Carbanions. If you really had a free carbanion, that would be so insanely reactive. Wow, just incredible reactivity. Okay, where do you get these things from? They're easy to make, or at least easy for you. They're not easy to make in the laboratory. Um, but industrially, they make this on a big scale. Um, so they're easy to make industrial on a large scale, and then they sell them to people. Let's go and talk about how you'd make these. So let's just suppose you had an alkyl chloride on hand. You know how to make alkyl chlorides, right? There's all this stuff from Chem 51A is making alkyl chlorides, SOCl2 and pyridine, thionyl chloride and pyridine. You convert al alcohols into alkyl chlorides. Adding HCl across double bonds gives you more substituted, uh, usually secondary alkyl halides. If you've got an alkyl chloride or an alkyl bromide or an alkyl iodide, it's easy to convert that into an alkylithium. You just add lithium metal. Now the book is really big on you remembering the stoichiometry, so it actually takes two equivalents of lithium metal, uh, or twice as many moles of lithium metal as you had alkyl chloride. And there you go, that's it. But the other byproduct is just not interesting. We, we, don't, we don't usually draw out this byproduct because we don't draw out salts. Uh, I'll just say don't bother drawing that unless I specifically tell you 
draw the salt byproduct you get. And I would never do that. So we don't draw the lithium chloride byproduct that you get from that process. See how easy it is? You guys know how to make alkyl chlorides. Um, you can do the same thing with magnesium if you wanted. I'm going to show you a different substrate, an aryl group, because you know how to make uh, bonds between halogens uh, and benzene rings. If you had toluene, you could brominate it and get a mixture of ortho and para isomers and separate out this para isomer. So if you wanted, you can convert this into an alkyl lithium. You just add two equivalents of lithium, and that's it. You've got a phenyl lithium. You know, it looks kind of like there's a leaving group, except you can't do SN2 or SN1 in this carbon bromine bond. But all you have to do is treat this with magnesium. And the book is really picky about you knowing the solvent for this reaction. You have to give the solvent as well. It only works in ether uh, solvents. It doesn't work in dichloromethane or hexanes. You have to have ether as a solvent. So you have to remember magnesium and ether. You know, I seems kind of arbitrary to me, but I'm going to go along with that. Don't just draw magnesium, draw magnesium in ether. You just have to remember that combination. And when once you're done with that, you end up with this super nucleophilic bond. Wow, look at that. If you wanted, just let's just practice here. We could also do this with that lithium trick. If you wanted, you could use two lithiums and then convert this. How would you know which one? For you, they're both equally easy, so don't worry. You just choose the one you like. Um, and I'm not going to write the plus lithium chloride there. So it's super easy. Boy, these bonds are so nucleophilic. Look, you, you go from a leaving group to the most powerful nucleophile we have in the organic chemistry series. And that, that thinking is going to be difficult. Going towards this thinking where carbon is a super powerful nucleophile. I don't really feel like drawing out this reaction uh, to make sodium acetylides down down here at the bottom, you, I think you might remember that if you take terminal alkynes that have a CH on the end of the alkyne, and you add sodium amide, this incredibly powerful base. I don't remember whether they drew this with a covalent bond or whether they drew it with plus and minus. Doesn't matter. The amide anion deprotonates that to make acetylide anions, and so that and that has a carbon sodium. Wow, so super reactive classes of carbon nucleophiles that are so powerful and so useful in organic chemistry. Only we're teaching you something useful. <laughs> Finally. Okay, I think I already mentioned what happens when you take pyrophoric reagents and you expose them to air, which has water vapor in it. They're pyrophoric. So you don't want to have water in your reaction mixture. You don't want to expose these uh, to air that has water. If you make an alkyl lithium reagent or you buy it, <laughs> the last thing in the world you want to do is expose this to OH bonds because they'll instantly deprotonate. So this is, we do everything we can to avoid the presence of water, avoid the presence of alcohols, because we don't want this side reaction to occur. It just wastes our, our precious reagent. What a waste. It just hurts me to think about taking a, a valuable equivalent of butyl lithium and doing nothing more than a deprotonation. We're almost always trying to avoid these kinds of reactions. Um, you know, it makes a carbon hydrogen bond. Here's the carbon hydrogen bond. We usually don't draw those carbon hydrogen bonds. And you generate sodium ethoxide as a byproduct in this process. But, I, you know, there's, there's easier ways to make ethoxide anion if you really wanted it. You'd also have a lithium plus floating around. This is a side reaction. We're trying to avoid these. Don't put alcohols, don't run reactions with alkyl lithiums in the presence of alcohols. Don't expose your Grignard reagents. If you make a Grignard reagent with a carbon magnesium bond, don't expose those to water. You're just going to waste the reagent faster than it can attack a carbonyl, which is what we really want to do with these, these powerful nucleophiles it will simply deprotonate the water faster. And what a boring, boring outcome um, to simply, to take a powerful nucleophilic bond and simply use that as a base. That's just a waste. Okay. And there's a bromomagnesium salt floating around there. Um, the other thing that I'm going to tell you don't do, and this is going to kill you, 
because up until this point, all you've really had as far as nucleophilic reactions is SN2. SN2 on this, SN2 on that. <laughs> These reagents are, are, I know I'm telling you it's powerful, but they don't do, I don't even want to draw this out. I'm just going to say don't do SN2. No SN2. It's not good. No SN2. No. No. Don't try to do that. And you may be thinking, well, dude, you just said that alkalithiums are so powerful. <laughs> you know, then why can't I do SN2 with that? I'll put this in with dots here just to, because I don't really want to draw full arrows there. Don't do this. Something happens. What happens is E2 elimination. You get all E2 elimination. You don't get any of the carbon-carbon bonds you think you're going to get if you over-memorized SN2. Um, again, you can't do with Grignard reagents that have carbon-magnesium bonds. You can't do SN2. Uh, with alkyl lithium bonds, you can't do SN2. They just don't work well, right? If you want to make carbon-carbon bonds, add to carbonyls. That's the way to make a carbon-carbon bond. Let's go ahead and get on to that. Wow, that's what we want to do. We want to add our, these alkyl lithiums and these Grignard reagents to carbonyls. So let me take you back in time to this class of reagents that you already know about, um, and that's sodium acetylide anions. Why would anybody uh, make a sodium acetylide anion by deprotoning an alkyne with, uh, with sodium amide. And when you make reagents like this, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to add that into the carbonyl and make a carbon-carbon bond. And then we follow that up with an aqueous workup. Here's the intermediate that you get. You, you don't have to draw this intermediate. I'm just trying to show you. Uh, what happens here. There we go. There was initially an H here, and we'll get a, a mixture of an, anti, of an antimer here. You can't really control whether the carbon adds from the top face, the bottom face. Doesn't matter which bond you've drawn as, as bold here. You could have drawn any of these three bonds as bold. They're all fine. Um, then after that aqueous workup, you're simply protonating this. We, we like to isolate neutral molecules in organic chemistry. And we get plus E here. I hope I can fit all this on, on the page. There we go. So that's the product of that reaction. And the reaction is based on the idea that there's a carbon-sodium bond in here that's nucleophilic. And that carbon-sodium bond is attacking to make a CC bond. Half of the, the, uh, of the Alkynyl anions add from the top face, the other half add from the bottom face. You can't control that. They collide with equal frequency from top and bottom face. So half of your 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules are the top molecule I've drawn, the other half are the mirror image that I've indicated with plus E. You need to recognize when you form new stereogenic centers and clearly indicate stereochemistry um, and the presence of stereoisomers. When I ask you, uh, to draw the products of the reactions. Boy, carbon-sodium bonds, that's what they're for. They're not for doing SN2. Let's go ahead and take another example. Let's get onto these alkyl lithium reagents. Let's suppose I take a ketone, and then I add in a phenyl lithium to that. Boy, if I brominated a benzene ring, I would immediately want to convert that into an alkyl lithium, because that's really the useful reagent there. You can also buy phenyl lithium. Most, <laughs> nobody makes that in the lab. You buy that. It's by bottles of phenylithium and solvent. And then we transfer it with syringes to keep it from being exposed to air. So you, you add the phenyl group to the carbonyl and then you protonate the O minus with water. And so the product of the reaction uh, is going to have, um, <clears throat> is going to have that, that phenyl group on there. I'll just arbitrarily draw the phenyl group going up. You know, it's, some people get a little bit, can, whoops, I, I, should, I, I should do something to indicate stereochemistry there. If I'm going to put this uh, a wedge, I should put one of the bonds next to it as a dash, and then I'll write plus E. You know, some people get confused. It's like, well, why did you choose to draw the phenyl bond up and not one of the, I could have drawn any one of these bonds as being the wedge. It's arbitrary, just as long as I'm clear to indicate that it's either the R enantiomer or the S enantiomer, and then I write plus E to indicate the mirror images there. So I always look to see, did I just generate a new stereogenic center? A stereogenic center is a carbon with four substituents 
and they're all different. That's stereogenic. Here's a case where I wouldn't generate a stereogenic center. The two sides of this ketone are identical and indistinguishable. If I add in an equivalent of a Grignard reagent like ethyl magnesium bromide, it would work just as well if I took ethyl magnesium chloride or ethyl magnesium iodide. It's, there's no difference there. How do you decide what you're going to use in the lab? Well, actually, we order bottles of this from the supplier. We would probably just pick the cheapest one. Um, and, and I don't remember which one is cheaper. It depends on whether bromoethane is easier to make into the Grignard reagent or not. So the product of this reaction uh, has an ethyl group, but it's not a stereogenic center at this carbon where you add it. The, the, because the one side of the cyclopentane ring is indistinguishable from the other, that's not a stereogenic center. Don't draw a dash or a wedge on these. Um, don't write plus E for sure. I, I guess you could draw a, a dash or a wedge, but don't write plus E because there is no indistinguishable mirror image. The mirror image is indistinguishable and identical. That means you don't understand stereochemistry. Wow. We've got the, um, boy, just look, finally, we're doing some amazing and powerful chemistry. Addition of alkyl lithiums and green yarn reagents to carbonyls. I'm positive every single instructor in, the, in organic chemistry who has ever taught organic chemistry um, asks about these on the exams. It's just a super common. So let's suppose I ask you to make, this is why you, you want to learn these reactions. Let's suppose I ask you to make this compound. And of course, you can't make just one enantiomer, so we'll just write plus E. So a racemic version of that compound. How would you make that? Well, I showed you a powerful bond-forming reaction where we add nucleophiles to carbonyls. And you have a lot of choices here. One, let's talk about all the different ways that you could make these carbon-carbon bonds in this alcohol product. So one thing we could do, and I expect you to be good at working backwards, one thing we could do is we can add the phenyl carbon bond. And the way you would do that is you start with a ketone that has these groups on there, and then you add some kind of a phenyl nucleophile. It could be phenyl magnesium bromide, it could be phenyl lithium, um, phenyl magnesium chloride, phenyl magnesium iodide, all okay. Uh, and then we follow this with an aqueous workup. So we could make the bond between the phenyl and the carbonyl carbon. But maybe you don't have any of this alkynyl ketone sitting around in the lab. Maybe what you have is this very inexpensive starting material called acetophenone. Maybe the bond we want to make is the bond between the alkyne and the carbonyl carbon. Well, that's easy to do. Uh, that's, that's no problem. So we just come along, we add step one, the acetylide anion. Step two, water. There we go. So we can make this carbon alkynyl bond if we want to. There's another starting material we could have used to make this. Let's suppose, well, th this, al this alkynyl ketone looks really volatile to me. It's hard to work with volatile compounds. They evaporate easily. They're hard to weigh out. I dispense by volume. Acetophenone is super common. You could probably buy 50 gallons of that for a penny or whatever, I mean, so inexpensive. But let's suppose you looked on the shelf and you didn't have any of this, or uh, maybe instead you had this other type of alkynyl ketone and you wanted to make a bond between the methyl group. That's easy. You just take either methyl magnesium bromide or methyl magnesium iodide. I mean, it could be methyl lithium. I'm just, just to be different here, to kind of show off that I, I'll use methyl magnesium iodide. Step two, I'm gonna put water. And it's a water workup. And the water, we're not trying to do SN1 reactions with carbocations, we're not trying to do SN2, we're just trying to protonate the OH. That's what the water is in these cases. If you wanted, you could use Arabic numerals. Arabic numeral one, Arabic numeral two, but you have to enumerate those steps. You have to. So it, it's important for you to practice these reactions so that you can work backwards to every possible starting material. When I show you an alcohol, I'm going to ask you questions about synthetic strategy that require you to have thought backwards. 
about different ways that you could have made alcohols. So when you see alcohols, you need to think, yeah, I could have made a bond to a carbonyl to make that alcohol, either a high HC bond or a carbon-carbon bond. Now, every once in a while, you, you want to add to carbonyls when there's an OH in your molecule. So let, let's go ahead and talk about this transformation. This is a very typical transformation that you want to do in modern organic synthesis, where you want to form a carbon-carbon bond to this carbonyl, but there's this annoying OH bond right there in your molecule. And you can't just throw in T-butyllithium with this because the first thing it will do is it will deprotonate the alcohol and then it will destroy your, your, your alkyl lithium reagent. Or in this case, if we wanted to add methyl magnesium iodide, the methyl is not going to add to the carbonyl group. The, the methyl group is going to deprotonate the OH first. You'll never get any new carbon-carbon bond. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to protect this OH so it doesn't destroy our reagent. And I'll show you how we do this. What we do is we convert this into a silyl ether. And you've never seen anything like this before. This is going to seem so crazy to you. It's like, what is that, a silyl ether? And here's the silyl ether that we're going to make. It's a tert butyl dimethyl silyl ether. Well, not, why not three methyl groups on the silicon? Silicon is right below carbon in the periodic table. So if it were easy to remove, you'd make an O-methyl ether or an O-ethyl ether, but those aren't easy to remove. This, it's easy to make in 100% yield. It's not an SN2 reaction. We're not gonna talk about the mechanism for this reaction. And the reagent that we use is tert butyl, italics T, butyl, dimethyl, Me2, silyl, chloride. And I know you can see the leaving group there, but that doesn't mean you know the mechanism. The mechanism is not SN2. Don't worry about the mechanism. And we use a really specific base here called imidazole. Imidazole. Sorry for that I I wrote there. <laughs> Ignore that little dot above the A. That was because I had mistaken. You have to memorize that two reagent combination. If you memorize this, the reaction will work in 100% yield. That's why we do this, because it works in 100% yield. It's so satisfying. And we use this protecting group so much that in chemistry, we give it this abbreviation, TBDMS. That's the way we, so I'll just write it like that. Now, now, because we have this, there's no OHs on here, now we can do additions to this carbonyl. You could use lithium aluminum hydride. You could use sodium borohydride. You could use alkyl lithiums. None of those are going to hurt this O-silicon bond. The O-silicon bond would just sit there. It doesn't matter how you draw this out, O-T-B-D-M-S. Um, let's go ahead and take an example. Let's suppose we use an alkyl lithium reagent, and then we follow this up with an aqueous workup. That'll add another methyl group to this carbonyl, and there we go. And now we simply have to worry about removing that tert-butyl dimethyl silo group. I'll just write it out as TBDMS. And we have another secret recipe for doing that that works in 100% yield every time. That's why chemists love it. It may seem like a lot of steps to protect this alcohol and then remove that silicon protecting group, but the reactions work so efficiently and in such high yield that, that every chemist loves to do these reactions. And the reagent is tetrabutylammonium fluoride anion. And you may be wondering, where does that OH come from? They're not telling you there's a water workup after this. And for some reason, the book doesn't mention that. So you're probably going to be wondering, well, how do you get an H on there? It's because there's a water workup. I'm not going to draw the water workup because the book doesn't. And I, I don't want to confuse you with that, but um, there, there's an aqueous workup. You don't need to know the mechanisms for fluoride deprotection of a TBDMS group. You don't need to know the mechanism for making a silicon oxygen bond with by protecting that OH with a tert butyl dimethyl silo group. You don't need to know those mechanisms. You don't even know, need to know the structure of imidazole. Um, but I expect you to know these, these, these recipes for protecting an OH as the silo ether and deprotecting it with tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. And this is so common, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, that we call this TBAF. Nobody in, my, in the lab calls it tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. We just call it TBAF. Like, hey, do you have a bottle of tea bath? Yes. Okay, that's all we're going to get to today. I'm so excited that we finally got 
to alkylithiums and Grignard reagents and powerful nucleophiles for adding to carbonyls. This is the way we make carbon-carbon bonds. I promise you I'm going to ask you many different variations on these reactions. I promise you every section of Chem 51 is going to ask you different variations on these reactions. Get out here and practice those reactions over and over. Work every single problem in chapter 20 in your textbook, whatever version of the text, that's the fifth edition. Um, get, work every problem you can get your hands on. These are so important and will continue to be important in later chapters.